Hello there. It's been over two years now since I purchased the Celestron Edge HD 11 telescope. The reason I bought this telescope was firstly that it gathers light quickly with the big 11 inch aperture and I live here in the UK so I've got to make the most of those clear nights. And secondly because this telescope can be configured in a range of different ways uh, to give different focal lengths. And that's attractive because of all the different apparent sizes of the different targets from the very small planets to larger uh, galaxies and then the even larger uh, nebulae. So that's why I bought the telescope and I've spent quite a long time developing configurations of it for different purposes. So what I want to do today is share those configurations with you but first I'm going to show you some modifications I've made to the telescope which are generic. In other words uh, those modifications are always there regardless of which of the configurations I'm using. So let's get started. So the first thing I want to show you is a simple mod I've made on the secondary mirror. The Edge HD telescope is a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, which means it has a large primary mirror at the back, it has a secondary mirror at the front, and it has a corrector plate that supports that secondary mirror. Now, one thing that's very important on Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes is collimation. And the collimation is achieved by adjusting the orientation of the secondary mirror. Now, when the uh, Edge HD comes, it comes with three small screws that you have to adjust with screwdrivers for adjusting the collimation. And that's not terribly convenient. So what I've done is to replace those screws with these three uh, thumb screws uh, from Bob's Knobs. So I'll put the details, in fact, for all the things I'm going to show you, I will put the details in the description and also display them on the screen for you. So if you want to make these modifications, you know what it is uh, that I'm talking about. And the great thing about these, they're little knurled thumb screws, and they allow you to modify the angle of the secondary mirror really easily without needing to get a screwdriver out. And I'd be very nervous anyway, having the pointy end of a screwdriver anywhere near this precious corrector plate. So that's the first mod, is the uh, three Bob's Knobs collimation screws on the secondary mirror. The next accessory I want to show you is that I've added a Celestron Losmandy dovetail bar on the top of the telescope. Now the telescope already comes with one of these on the bottom for attaching it to the mount. But by adding another one of these on the top of the telescope, it gives us some real advantages. To attach this dovetail bar, we simply pick up on existing threaded holes at the front and the back of the telescope and the bar comes with the bolts needed to attach it. So that's great. But what do I use it for? So uh, first and foremost, it's useful for attaching accessories such as a guide scope or a dew heater controller or maybe uh, a control computer. But there is another benefit of attaching one of these bars on the top of the telescope and that is by having two of them on opposite sides of the telescope, the top end of these bars is really convenient for resting your dew shield against and it helps to make sure that the dew shield is always on straight and not crooked which can affect your photos. So that's the Celestron Losmandy uh, dovetail bar. The next thing I want to show you is the dew heater. Now there are various different solutions for the Edge HD for dew heating. Uh, it's very important to have dew heating on this telescope because the front corrector plate uh, has been referred to online by people as a dew magnet. It really does dew up very, very easily if you've got the right conditions, which is of course um, temperatures below the dew point and lots of moisture in the air. Uh, so I use an Astro Zap dew heater band that is strapped around the very front edge of the telescope as you can see here. Now this has proven very, really effective when used in conjunction with the dew shield and the dew shield, which I'll show you in a moment, uh, fits snugly over the outside of this heater band and rests on the ends of the two Lusmundi bars as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so that it works really well for me. I am aware that Celestron actually make a dedicated heater band that mounts on the inside here uh, in place of this retaining ring that holds the corrector plate in place. But I have read some concerning reports online that that heater band unevenly heats the corrector plate and can cause distortion uh, to the image, 
which worried me a little. So actually, although I've bought one of those bands, I've been reluctant to uh, fit it up to now. I'd be really interested to hear any comments that you have, any experiences you have uh, with that heater band, whether you think it's good or not good. Uh, because if, of course, if you can put that inside there, then the, there's no interference, if you like, between the, the dew shield and the dew heater. So the next thing I'm going to show you is the dew shield itself. Okay, so the dew shield I use is from Kendrick, and it's the dew cap that they make for the Celestron C11. It's a flexible uh, material, and it has a Velcro join, so you can adjust the diameter of it to a certain extent. Uh, it's flocked on the inside, which is nice, uh, and if you adjust the Velcro suitably, you can get it to fit very snugly over the outside of that dew heater and as I said before it rests on top of the two uh, ends of the Los Mandy dovetail bars. So that's the dew shield that I use. The next modification I want to show you is to do with the air vents. schmidt cassegrain telescopes are effectively a closed system because of the corrector plate on the front. So without these air vents the air inside would not be able to to move around, would not be able to um, be replaced with colder air from outside and it would make it very difficult to get a temperature equalization between the telescope's optics and the surrounding air. So the telescope already comes with an air vent on either side of the primary mirror at the rear of the, of the scope and uh, but the the airflow through the telescope would be very very slow if you just used the vents. This is what the vents look like, they're just two plastic pieces with a gauze mesh in between them that allows air to flow but not dust and debris and that sits on here like so and what I've done is to replace both vents with the Tempest system from Deep Space Products. Now this is essentially a replacement item looks very much the same except that it has an electrical fan on the inside of it. So I fitted one of these to each side the fans run off 12 volts, and you can see there's a 5.5 by 2.1 millimeter jack socket here, which is how you apply the 12 volts to the fan. And there's a wire that runs inside the telescope behind the primary mirror. It's very easy to fit, by the way. Uh, and that means you only need to apply 12 volts to one side or the other, and that will power both of the fans. Now, one fan will blow, and the other one will suck so that the air flows in one direction across the primary mirror. That helps. Uh, to speed up the process of equalizing temperatures and getting everything down to the surrounding ambient air temperature and also breaks up what's called the boundary layer on the primary mirror to give you a better quality image. So as I said, this is the Tempest system or temperature equalization system for telescopes from Deep Space Products. So the next thing I want to show you is to do with the focusing knob. The focusing knob on the back of the telescope has two associated mirror locking uh, knobs as well. Uh, these have to be loose if you want to adjust the focus using this manual focus knob. Now what this knob actually does is to move the primary mirror forwards and backwards inside the telescope and actually this will turn uh, many many times uh, for the maximum travel forwards and backwards of the telescope. Now, I don't use this manual focus knob for all my configurations. And the reason for this is that in some configurations, the, uh, the mirror flop that you get, effectively the mirror will actually rock uh, one way or the other, depending on whether you're turning this knob clockwise or anti-clockwise. And that can actually shift the image uh, that you're actually seeing on your camera. And that can be really problematic. So for some of my configurations, I lock off the focus and I use a micro focuser which I'll show you later. For other ones I can't use a micro focuser and uh, for those ones I put an, a, a stepper motor, it's a ZWO uh, EAF uh, that I mount on here and I'll show you that in just a moment. Just one very simple thing that I do is I actually put a piece of white sticky tape on this knob here because for all the different configurations I have of the telescope uh, the position that the mirror needs to be in for me to achieve focus is different. So what I've done is to uh, put this tape on here so I can count the number of rotations. And I've written down in my logbook 
If I rotate anti-clockwise until I reach a stop, I then, my logbook tells me, there we go, I won't turn anymore. So I can now count one rotation, two rotations, etc. And I know maybe for one configuration, I need to go eight and a half turns clockwise. For another one, I might need to go 25 turns clockwise. So that's a really handy way of getting this to the right position for a certain configuration. But what I'm going to show you now, very quickly, is how this can be replaced, the manual knob be substituted for a ZWO EAF uh, remote focus control. So obviously we need to keep these locking knobs open and uh, in order to fit the uh, EAF, we need to remove the focus knob which just slides off. Very important to do this with the telescope in the horizontal position. And I'm going to undo these screws. If you don't have the tel telescope horizontal, this assembly can actually fall out, so you need to be very careful. I'm going to undo these th three screws. There we go. So the base of the EAF looks like this. And what I'm going to do is take the three screws out of this plate and I'm going to put the plate underneath the EAF, so this way up, and put the screws back in, like so. And then with this part pointing out uh, from the edge of the telescope, I can put these back in place and do up these screws. And this can be a little fiddly. The screws don't always want to sit at exactly the right angle, but I've been lucky there. That one's bitten straight away, which is great. Uh, you can see the sort of modifying their angles quite readily. It's a little bit fiddly to do, uh, but eventually it will bite on its thread and go in like that. And then the last one. And this is the, the bracket to which the rest of the EAF fits. You can see I'm struggling a little bit with this last screw and it will eventually allow me to do that up. There it goes. Okay. So it's important not to over tighten these. They just need to be just firm so that that doesn't move. And now we can fit the rest of the assembly. So this is the ZWO EAF and I've got the version 2 that runs off USB so it doesn't need separate power. I've got a temperature thermistor connected to this so it can monitor temperature and I've bought the adapter bracketing system which is this piece and this piece and actually this piece which enable you to mount it to the Edge HD 11. So what's going to happen is this is going to engage uh, the universal joint here engages on the focus knob and we slide that on. You need to make sure that these grub screws are properly undone so there's no protrusion inside. Just going to get an Allen key and just make sure that's properly undone. Okay, so that should now slide on there nicely, like so. And then there are two bolts to fit underneath here. So I'll just fit the two bolts. So here you can see it's all fully fitted. These are the two bolts that hold the two right brackets at right angles to each other. You've got the EAF here, the universal joint here. Uh, of course, you need to tighten up the two grub screws on the universal joint so it grabs hold of the uh, focus knob. And that's the uh, remote electronic autofocus arrangement that I use for some of the configurations um, that I have developed. For others, I just uh, stick with the manual focus knob for reasons you'll see later. Uh, when I'm using the manual focus knob, I would undo the locking knobs, uh, move the manual focus into the required position, and then lock the mirror in place, and the rest of the focusing would be done by a microfocuser on the back of the main optical train but I'll show you that later in the video. So those are all the generic modifications I've made to my telescope. What I'm gonna do now is take you through the different configurations that I've developed over the last couple of years 
for visual, planetary and deep sky astrophotography. And we'll start with the simplest one, which is for visual observing. We've got firstly an option of with or without the 0.7 times reducer, which comes separately from the telescope. I'm going to show you it with the reducer. This is the reducer here. Uh, but the configuration behind the reducer uh, would just be mounted directly to here if you weren't using the reducer. So we'll start off by fitting the reducer. As you can hear, it's quite a chattery thread on there makes a lot of noise but doesn't do it any harm uh, and the next thing we need is this uh, visual back uh, for the for the edge HD so that goes on the back of the reducer and the next thing we need is the diagonal uh, very useful to use the diagonal this both converts from the thread on the visual back to a two inch um, nose piece adapter, but also gives you that much more comfortable viewing angle so that you can look down into your telescope instead of having to crouch down on the ground and look up. So now we can fit that to the visual back. Okay, that's nice and secure. And now we can put in the eyepiece. Now the, the Edge HD comes with this really lovely, huge, uh, two inch eyepiece, which is really fantastic. And that can go straight in there and just do up the two thumb screws, just nip them up so that they can't fall out. And that is a basic visual observing uh, setup. This is a 23 millimeter eyepiece. So you may have other eyepieces that you want to try uh, with your telescope to change your field of view. And they might, might be inch and a quarter. So it's fairly straightforward to take out a two inch eyepiece and to use one of these twist lock adapters or even uh, just a regular thumb screw adapter that converts from a two inch to a one and a quarter inch. So I've fitted a uh, one and a quarter inch eyepiece here to one of those adapters and that will just drop straight in. And now I can use one and a quarter inch eyepieces with this. So that's the visual observing setup. Next, we're gonna look at a planetary imaging setup. So I'm going to show you two planetary setups, one without a microfocuser and one with a microfocuser. So we'll start with the one without the microfocuser. And of course, we still need to be able to focus. So I've got the EAF fitted onto the focus knob and the two locking knobs unscrewed. And we start with the Celestron M48T adapter. And we'll pop that on the back of the telescope. And now we need to reduce the M48 down to M42. So for that, I've got a, uh, an adapter M48 to M42, 16 and a half millimeters long. And we'll pop that onto the back of the M48T adapter. Okay, and the next item is this. It's the Starguider Imaging Flip Mirror. Um, again, check the links in the description for details uh, of these. This is going to screw in, make sure it's the right way around, onto the M42 male thread. And we can just loosen this ring to make it uh, point upwards. So this will hold an inch and a quarter eyepiece. I'll pop that in the top there and it has a focusing ring here which we can lock off with this screw so we can adjust the focus because we're going to want to make sure we've got focus on the camera and focus in the eyepiece at the same time and I spent quite a long time adjusting this setup to make sure I could actually achieve that. So the next item is an M42 male to inch and a quarter uh, female adapter and that goes on to the end of the flip mirror box and now into that we can insert a times two Barlow. Now this is an optional item uh, if you leave it out uh, that's, you can carry on with the remaining items but you'll have to adjust the position 
of the focus knob to achieve focus. Next item is an atmospheric dispersion corrector. This is the ZWO atmospheric dispersion corrector. And this is to correct for the effect of the atmosphere, particularly if you're looking at a planet uh, uh, low in the sky, the atmosphere acts like a prism and it splits the red end and the blue end of the spectrum and you'll get a kind of red tinge on one side of the planet and a blue tinge on the other side. It's very unsightly. Uh, and these two levers can be pushed away from this nominal position further and further apart and that applies more and more of a correction for atmospheric dispersion. So I'll put that back in its no correction position and notice I've got this nylon locking knob uh, lined up with the two levers. That puts the spirit level in the right place. Oh and I've got an, an inch and a quarter nose piece on here with an IR cut filter on the end of it. So I can pop that in and I just rotate it until the spirit level shows me that it's level and lock that off. Okay, and then there's two more items. One is an M42 male to male adapter and the other is my camera. So this is a ZWO ASI 662MC and that goes on the end here. Okay, so why this particular setup? Well, firstly, the flip mirror is essential because the sensor in the camera is very small and I'm using a very long focal length. I've got 2,800 millimeters in the telescope and a times two Barlow. So I'm at 5.6 meters of focal length. So the field of view of this sensor in the night sky is absolutely tiny and it's really, really difficult. In fact, the most challenging thing uh, is to get the planet on the sensor and the second most challenging thing is getting it in focus but especially when the seeing is bad and it's, everything's wobbling around. Uh, so uh, having this really long focal length really causes trouble in trying to get the planet on the sensor so the flip mirror is there to help with that and what happens is by flipping the mirror down it deflects the light that's heading towards the camera up into the eyepiece and I've got a 40 millimeter eyepiece. The highest um, focal length eyepiece I can choose so I get the widest possible field of view and uh, the field of view in there is a lot bigger than the sensor so if I can get the planet visible in the eyepiece I can then adjust the, the pointing of the telescope until the planet's in the middle of that eyepiece view and then I can flip the mirror up and the light will go straight through onto the sensor and you should succeed in getting the planet on the sensor. Now, believe it or not, even with this setup, it can still be really difficult to get the planet actually visible in the eyepiece. And for that reason, I fit a Telrad onto the top of the telescope and I use that first. Of course, I have to get an alignment between the main optical train and the Telrad. But once you've got that, you're, you're really in business because you use the Telrad first to get close enough to the, tar to the uh, target that you can see it in the eyepiece then fine tune through the eyepiece, then put the mirror, uh, mirror up, and then we should be in business with the uh, object on the sensor. So this has been uh, uh, successfully used uh, imaging planets. I'm still actually waiting for a night of really good seeing, that magical night each year I've been told happens when uh, the seeing is really great. So uh, I'm not terribly proud of my planetary images uh, yet, but uh, I'm still working on that. But that, this setup I really like. So now I'm going to show you a modification to this setup where I use the micro focuser. And the first thing to do to, uh, to do that is to replace this M48T adapter with my micro focuser. Okay, so I've taken that assembly off and you'll see I've removed the EAF focus controller. and I've put the knob back on so I can put that in the required position and then lock off the mirror. So I've now got the Arco two inch a micro focuser. It's got the adapter for the SCT telescope on the front and it's got a two inch visual back adapter on the back. So we can put that onto the back of the telescope now. There we go. Now what we can do is take the assembly we had before, 
which is the flip mirror, the Times 2 Barlow, the ADC, the M42 male to male and the camera and add this two inch nose piece at adapter to M42, which actually comes with the flip mirror. So we'll pop that onto the flip mirror box like that. And now this will fit into the back of the microfocuser and we can do up the three thumb screws to hold it in place. And then the final item, of course, is to pop the 40 millimeter eyepiece back in there. So now we have the same planetary setup, but with no mirror flop issues. All of our focus is done by the Asato uh, because the mirror has been locked, but everything else works exactly the same as before. Again, the tail rad on the top is an important part of this setup. So here's the tail rad on the top of the telescope. You see I've mounted it on a Losmandy clamp, it's from ADM. And I've also modified my tail rad because I had a lot of problems with this little glass window doing up. So I fitted three little resistors inside it and they're powered from 12 volts. So I'm picking up from my Juhi to controller to power that. Uh, and the three little screws on the back of the tail rad allow me to adjust the position of the two red rings. So when you look through the tail rad, you focus your eyes on infinity, this is what you see. These concentric rings, which you can then, by turning the little screws, you can move one way, the next screw moves it this way, the next screw moves it that way. So that's the tail rad. And once I've aligned that, so what I'll do perhaps is point at the moon, which is nice and easy to get in the eyepiece, get the moon centered, and then move the tail rad rings to be centered in the center of the moon. If I haven't got the moon, I have to use something like a star. Uh, I just have to fight for a while until you uh, accidentally get that star visible through the eyepiece, then put it in the center, then look through your tail rad and turn the three little screws until the red rings are centered on the star, and then you're in business. You can move over to the planet, look through the tail rad, center the planet in the middle of the tail rad rings, then switch off the tail rad, look through the eyepiece, recenter again, and then flip the mirror up and you're away. So that's a really good setup, sort of three steps to actually finding the planet and getting it on the sensor. So what I want to show you now is the setup I use in the main optical train for deep sky astrophotography at 1960 millimeter focal length. So that's F7. And I start with the 0.7 times reducer. That brings us down from 2800 millimeter to 1960. I've got the manual focus knob and I'm gonna get that in the approximately correct position and then lock off the two mirror lock knobs so that I don't get any mirror flop. And then I'm using the two inch uh, Prima Luce uh, Isato. Now that's got uh, the Arco rotator which goes with the Asato. Uh, you can purchase it separately or you can purchase them together, I believe. Uh, and there's a few adapters needed here. So on this, uh, this side, on the front side, you've got the telescope adapter uh, for the uh, Edge HD telescope. In between the Arco and the, the Asato is the Asato to Arco two inch adapter. Uh, and then at the back, I'm going to fit uh, another adapter ring, and this is an adjustable adapter ring which goes uh, from M56 uh, to M54 uh, and it's important that this is an adjustable ring uh, because we have to be very careful uh, because the next item in the chain is the filter wheel and it's really important that we don't encroach too far into the filter wheel otherwise this adapter will actually touch the filters and stop the filter wheel from turning. So I'm going to fit this adapter onto the Arco and once that is in place, I'm going to undo this uh, slip ring. I'm going to make sure the main thing does not undo itself. I just want the slip ring to undo. You can see how much protrusion you've got there. And that protrusion of the thread must not be more than the amount of thread that you see in the filter wheel. So I'm using the ZWO EFW. It's the two inch filter wheel. Uh, it's got seven filters in it. So I have LRGB, um, sulfur, hydrogen, oxygen filters in there. And you can see 
hopefully you can see uh, there's not very much thread there's maybe four turns on the thread in there so i don't want more than four turns showing on this so i can now mount one to the other Okay, now once I've got that basically uh, screwed in there, I can tighten up the adjuster ring just to get it nice and tight. And I've got an M42 male to male adapter on the other side of the filter wheel. And here I've got my ASI 2600 MM Pro, and I'm gonna make that on the top of there. And now this whole assembly can be attached to the reducer. Very important to always take your time with these threads because crossing a thread is not something you want to do. Okay, so there we have it. We've got a 1960 millimeter focal length. The mirror's locked off, so there's no mirror flop. There's no image shift. We've got the micro focuser with the Asato two inch, the Arco for the rotation control, uh, the filter wheel and the monochrome camera. Now at this focal length and for deep sky astrophotography where we're using very long exposures and not shooting video like we are with planetary, uh, we need to auto guide. I'm not a fan of off axis guiding and uh, you'll notice that this imaging train does not have an off-axis guider in it so I use a separate guide scope mounted to my uh, top dovetail so let's show you that now so this is the guide scope that I use when I'm at 1960 millimeter focal length uh, it is rather large I wish it wasn't as big as it is uh, but the mount can cope with it so I just use it uh, and it works really really well it's a TS optics 600 millimeter guide scope it's got a little dew shield on the front of it, a manual focuser with a locking knob, uh, and it's a rack and pinion focuser. And I just had to put some extra spaces in here to, uh, to achieve focus. And I have a one and a quarter inch adapter at the back. And then I use the ASI 174mm Mini from ZWO, which is particularly well matched to this guide scope because it has a very large sensor for a uh, one and a quarter inch camera. And that helps to get lots and lots of guide stars so uh, it works lovely in phd2 uh, you get lo lots and lots of guide stars even at uh, 600 millimeter focal length so that's that and you can see i've got it mounted on telescope rings on top of an eagle four but it could just as well be on a couple of uh, losmandy clamps straight onto the dovetail on the top there the last configuration i want to show you is the hyperstar setup and this is the configuration that i enjoy using the most on this telescope it reduces the focal length from 2800 millimeters to just 540. That gives us a really wide field of view, but the speed of the telescope is the really exciting thing. It is f1.8, which is incredibly fast. And there's nothing more enjoyable than pointing the Hyperstar uh, Edge 11 at something like M42, the Great Orion Nebula, with a hydrogen alpha filter and just shoot a single three to five minute sub uh, at f1.8. And the amount of detail you can see is just great. So I, I love this configuration. Uh, basically, it involves removing the secondary mirror from the front and fitting some lenses there, which is the Hyperstar uh, system, and putting the camera on the front of the telescope. So, so all of this... Uh, a configuration on the back here, which I showed you for 1960 millimeter focal length, that will come off and I'll just have a cover plate fitted. And uh, one of the compromises with Hyperstar is you can't use uh, a micro focuser. So I put the ZWO EAF back on the focus knob. You may be thinking, well, that will bring back the mirror flop and the image shift. Well, it does, but because you've got a very wide field of view, the effect of it is pretty small. So it's not really that much of a problem. You can't use the electronic filter wheel, uh, so you have to do manual filter changes, and you also can't use an electronic rotator. You have to do manual rotating to frame your shot. These three sacrifices are all worth it, believe me. Uh, the Hyperstar is just so cool. So the next thing I'm showing you is how to fit Hyperstar on the front of the telescope. So here's the Star Arizona Hyperstar. It's the V4 a Hyperstar for the 11 inch. Edge HD, and there are various options that you have to select when you buy this. 
and I bought the option with the uh, filter drawer and the adapter for ZWO cameras. So in order to fit this, the first thing we need to do is to remove the secondary mirror. Now, in the front of the Hyperstar, uh, there is uh, a screw-in tray, or it's like a holder effectively, uh, and that is really handy. Let's just unscrew that. And that is a receptacle for you to put the secondary mirror into. Now there's a little indexing notch on the side of this and there's also one on the secondary mirror. So if you're worried about messing up your collimation, so long as you don't disturb the collimation screws, uh, your collimation will be pretty much maintained. Well, you can always check it, of course, um, but uh, it doesn't mess up the collimation too much in my experience. So we undo this collar. I'm just being very cautious to make sure nothing falls here. Okay, so undo the collar. And secondary mirror, I'm just going to use a collimation bolt to pull it out, but I'm being careful not to turn a collimation screw. So there we go. So there is the secondary mirror. And I can just check the location of the little peg. It's just on the side here. So I've got to line that peg up with the slot in the receptacle and that drops in there really nicely. And what I can now do with the same ring that I just took off here, I screw that on the top and that's a really nice way of protecting your secondary mirror. And what I do with that actually is I put it in the uh, nice fur lined case that the Star Arizona Hyperstar comes in and that really protects it really well. So now we can take the Hyperstar and screw it into this central position. Again, being very careful to make sure that we're not crossing any threads. And we just knit that up gently, but no, no big torques here because we're actually putting force into the corrector plate, so we have to be careful not to put too much force in. Just going to take this opportunity to mention all these different uh, screws around here. So you see the long and short uh, uh, thumb, thumb screw here and then a pair here and a pair here. Those are for tilt adjustment. I haven't really had to adjust tilt much, it's all been fine. But the ones with the little nylon bases on them, those are for rotating. So when you want to frame your shot, you just loosen those slightly and now you can turn the body of the uh, of the Hyperstar along with your camera and that frames your shot and once your uh, angle is good you can lock that off. Important to lock it off because if it's not locked off you will get some tilt problems. So we can now undo a little cover on here. Okay so here's the camera. No adapters needed here because I've purchased the uh, Hyperstar with the ZWO interface already on it. Just, again, just feeling that thread. And that's on there. I'm just going to turn it and rotate it now, just so that you guys can see where the filter draw slot is. Hopefully you can see that now. It's just here. I'm just going to grab a filter. Okay, so here I have a red filter and I can slot that into here and it will engage and it sort of sucks itself in because it's actually magnetic. So you don't have to worry about it falling out. Just have to make sure you put it in the right way up and that's now a red filter. So it's very much a manual regime for changing the filters uh, because of course if you had a filter wheel here, it would block most of the light path. So what's actually happening with Hyperstar is instead of going down the tube up hitting the secondary and back down the tube again. So effectively going down the tube three times and giving a really long focal length. We're just going down the tube, hitting the primary mirror and coming back up and into the uh, Hyperstar lens system and straight into the camera. Um, but obviously one of the issues we do have is we've got to put cables to this camera and they're going to cross the, uh, the, <laughs> this, the light path. So we need to do that in a reasonably intelligent way. So that's the next thing I want to show you is how to do that. So this is what I purchased uh, online to take the cables across this 
boundary. Uh, it's a 3D printed uh, plastic item that uh, fits onto the rim of the telescope. And this D shape that it creates minimizes the diffraction spikes that are created by the blockage of the light path. So obviously I've, I've got a couple of cables here. We've got a DC power cable for the camera and we've got the USB cable. I'm using the flat USB cable that ZWO provide with the camera. And I can tuck that inside those uh, rotation screws and bring it up and plug in to the camera, making sure I don't block the cooling vents. And then I can do the same thing effectively with the power cable. Now to make sure I don't get any encroachment into the light path, uh, I then just fit an elastic band over the outside. I even managed to find a red elastic band to match the camera. That's a bit OCD, isn't it? Um, and But just to offset that is a regular colored elastic band. That just holds the cables nice and snug to the camera so they're not protruding and getting into the light path. And I've laced these cables onto this plastic 3D printed part uh, with a bit of cotton and trimmed it off so that I've got minimal uh, width on there, so minimal uh, interference to the diff diffraction patterns. Uh, I can now take my power from wherever my power is coming from, connect my USB, etc. So that works really well. And the other thing, of course, that I can do is then put the dew shield over the top of this. Now I have to be a little careful with these two cables, uh, but the dew shield will fit on over the top of the cables like that. Just move the camera back a bit so you can see what I'm doing. Um, that still fits on really nicely. For the guiding, I use the 9x50 guide scope that comes with the telescope, and I use that with a monochrome QHY 5L 2 camera. And that focal length works really nicely with the 540mm focal length of the Hyperstar. My dew heater controller is mounted on the bottom dovetail this time using the Losmandy clamp, same Losmandy clamp that I used on the top with the other configurations. And I make sure that the D-shape adapter uh, with the cables coming across uh, the light train uh, is uh, just opposite the dovetail at the bottom so the cables can come straight down and connect in to the USB and power sockets on the mount. Finally, I've got some technical drawings that I've prepared of each of the configurations that I've shown you in today's video. I'm going to show them to you now. You can hit pause and then take a screenshot and study them in your own time. So we'll start with the visual configuration. And here's the one for the planetary setup. And now here's the one for deep sky imaging at 1960 or 2800 millimeter focal length, depending on whether you fit the reducer or not. And finally, here's the configuration with the Hyperstar. I hope you found today's video useful. If you are going to buy any of the items that I've shown, please do check out in the description under the video as I've put some affiliate links in there. If you wouldn't mind using those, if you do make a purchase, it just helps the channel to grow as I get a small commission on those purchases and it won't cost you a penny extra. I hope you've enjoyed the video and I wish you clear skies and see you next time. Bye.